that year, towards the breaking up of the southwest monsoon, disquieting rumors reached Sambir. Captain Ford, coming up to Almayer's house for an evening's chat, brought late numbers of the Straits Times, giving the news of a keen war and of the unsuccessful Dutch expedition. The Nakotas of the rare trading prows ascending the river paid visits to Lakamba, discussing with that potentate the unsettled state of affairs, and wagged their head gravely over the recital of orang blanda exaction, severity, and general tyranny, as exemplified in the total stoppage of gunpowder trade and the rigorous visiting of all suspicious craft trading in the Straits of Makassar. Even the loyal soul of Lakamba was stirred into a state of inward discontent by the withdrawal of his license for powder and by the abrupt confiscation of 150 barrels of that commodity by the gunboat Princess Amelia, when, after a hazardous voyage, it had almost reached the mouth of the river. The unpleasant news was given him by Rashid, who, after the unsuccessful issue of his matrimonial projects, had made a long voyage amongst the islands for trading purposes, had bought the powder for his friend, and was overhauled and deprived of it on his return when actually congratulating himself on his acuteness in avoiding detection. Rashid's wrath was principally directed against Almayer, whom he suspected of having notified the Dutch authorities of the desultory warfare carried on by the Arabs and the Raja with the upriver Dayak tribes. To Rashid's great surprise, the Raja received his complaints very coldly, and showed no signs of vengeful disposition towards the white man. In truth, Lakamba knew very well that Almayer was perfectly innocent of any meddling in state affairs, and besides, his attitude towards that much persecuted individual was wholly changed in consequence of a reconciliation effected between him and his old enemy by Almayer's newly found friend, Dane Marula. Almayer had now a friend. Shortly after Rashid's departure on his commercial journey, Nina, drifting slowly with the tide in the canoe on her return home after one of her solitary excursions, heard in one of the small creeks a splashing as if of heavy ropes dropping in the water and the prolonged song of Malay seamen when some heavy pulling is to be done. Through the thick fringe of bushes hiding the mouth of the creek, she saw the tall spars of some European rigged sailing vessel overtopping the summits of the Nippa palms. A brig was being hauled out of the small creek into the main stream. The sun had set, and during the short moments of twilight, Nina saw the brig, aided by the evening breeze and the flowing tide, head towards Sambir under her set foresail. The girl turned her canoe out of the main river into one of the many narrow channels amongst the wooded islets and paddled vigorously over the black and sleepy backwaters towards Sambir. Her canoe brushed the water palms, skirted the short spaces of muddy bank where sedate alligators looked at her with lazy unconcern, and just as darkness was setting in, shot out into the broad junction of the two main branches of the river where the brig was already at anchor with sails furled, yards squared, and decks seemingly untenanted by any human being. Nina had to cross the river and pass pretty close to the brig in order to reach home on the low promontory between the two branches of the Pente. Of both branches and the houses built on the banks and over the water, the lights twinkled already, reflected in the still waters below, the hum of voices, the occasional cry of a child, the rapid and abruptly interrupted roll of a wooden drum, together with some distant hailing in the darkness by the returning fishermen, reached her over the broad expanse of the river.
She hesitated a little before crossing. The sight of such an unusual object as an European rigged vessel causing her some uneasiness. But the river in its wide expansion was dark enough to render a small canoe invisible. She urged her small craft with swift strokes of her paddle, kneeling in the bottom and bending forward to catch any suspicious sound while she steered towards the little jetty of Lingard and Company, to which the strong light of the paraffin lamp shining on the whitewashed veranda of Almayer's bungalow served as a convenient guide. The jetty itself, under the shadow of the bank, overgrown by drooping bushes, was hidden in darkness. Before even she could see it, she heard the hollow bumping of a large boat against its rotten posts, and heard also the murmur of whispered conversation in that boat, whose white paint in great dimensions, faintly visible on nearer approach, made her rightly guess that it belonged to the brig just anchored. Stopping her course by a rapid motion of her paddle, with another swift stroke, she sent it whirling away from the wharf and steered for a little rivulet, which gave access to the back courtyard of the house. She landed at the muddy head of the creek and made her way towards the house over the trodden grass of the courtyard. To the left, from the cooking shed, shone a red glare through a banana plantation she skirted, and the noise of feminine laughter reached her from there in the silent evening. She rightly judged her mother was not near, laughter and Mrs. Almayer not being close neighbors. She must be in the house, though, thought Nina, as she ran lightly up the inclined plane of shaky planks, leading to the back door of the narrow passage dividing the house in two. Outside the door, in the black shadow, stood the faithful Ali. Who is there? asked Nina. A great Malay man has come, answered Ali in a tone of suppressed excitement. He is a rich man. There are six men with lances. Real soldat, you understand, and his dress is very brave. I have seen his dress. It shines. What jewels! Don't go there, Mem Nina. Tuan said not, but the old Mem is gone. Tuan will be angry. Merciful Allah! What jewels that man has got! Nina slipped past the outstretched hand of the slave into the dark passage where, in the crimson glow of the hanging curtain, close by its other end, she could see a small dark form crouching near the wall. Her mother was feasting her eyes and ears with what was taking place on the front veranda, and Nina approached to take her share in the rare pleasure of some novelty. She was met by her mother's extended arm and by a low murmured warning not to make a noise. Have you seen them, mother? asked Nina in a breathless whisper. Mrs. Almayer turned her face towards the girl, and her sunken eyes shone strangely in the red half-light of the passage. I saw him, she said, in an almost inaudible tone, pressing her daughter's hand with her bony fingers. A great Raja has come to Sambir. A son of heaven, muttered the old woman to herself. Go away, girl. The two women stood close to the curtain. Nina, wishing to approach the rent and the stuff, and her mother defending the position with angry obstinacy. On the other side there was a lull in the conversation, but the breathing of several men, the occasional light tinkling of some ornaments, the clink of metal scabbards, or of brass serrae vessels passed from hand to hand, was audible during the short pause. The women struggled silently when there was a shuffling noise, and the shadow of Almayer's burly form fell on the curtain. The women ceased struggling and remained motionless. Almayer had stood up to answer his guest, turning his back to the doorway, unaware of what was going on on the other side. He spoke in a tone of regretful irritation. You have come to the wrong house, Tuan Morula. If you want to trade as you say, 
I was a traitor once, not now. Whatever you may have heard about me in Makassar, and if you want anything, you will not find it here. I have nothing to give, and want nothing myself. You should go to the Raja here. You can see in the daytime his house is across the river there, where those fires are burning on the shore. He will help you and trade with you, or better still, go to the Arabs over there. He went on bitterly, pointing with his hand towards the house of Sambir. Abdullah is the man you want. There is nothing he would not buy, and there is nothing he would not sell. Believe me, I know him well. He waited for an answer a short time, then added, All that I have said is true, and there is nothing more. Nina, held back by her mother, heard a soft voice reply with a calm evenness of intonation, peculiar to the better-class Malays. Who would doubt a white Tuan's words? A man seeks his friends where his heart tells him. Is this not true also? I have come, although so late, for I have something to say which you may be glad to hear. Tomorrow I will go to the Sultan, a traitor wants the friendship of great men, then I shall return here to speak serious words, if, Tuan permits, I shall not go to the Arabs. Their lies are very great. What are they? Chileka. Almayer's voice sounded a little more pleasantly in reply. Well, as you like, I can hear you tomorrow at any time if you have anything to say. Bah! After you have seen the Sultan Lakamba, you will not want to return here. Inchi Dayan. You will see. Only mind. I will have nothing to do with Lakamba. You may tell him so. What is your business with me, after all? Tomorrow we will talk to An. Now I know you, answered the Malay. I speak English a little, so we can talk and nobody will understand. And then, he interrupted himself suddenly, asking, surprised, What's that noise, Tuan? Almayer had also heard the increasing noise of the scuffle recommenced on the women's side of the curtain. Evidently, Nina's strong curiosity was on the point of overcoming Mrs. Almayer's exalted sense of social proprieties. Hard breathing was distinctly audible, and the curtain shook during the contest, which was mainly physical. Although Mrs. Almayer's voice was heard, an angry remonstrance with its usual want of strictly logical reasoning, but with the well-known richness of invective. You shameless woman, are you a slave? shouted shrilly the irate matron. Thou your face, abandoned wretch, you white snake, I will not let you. Almeyer's face expressed annoyance and also doubt as to the advisability of interfering between mother and daughter. He glanced at his Malay visitor, who was waiting silently for the end of the uproar in an attitude of amused expectation, and waving his hand contemptuously, he murmured, It is nothing, some women. The Malay nodded his head gravely, and his face assumed an expression of serene indifference, as etiquette demanded after such an explanation. The contest was ended behind the curtain, and evidently the younger will had its way, for the rapid shuffle and click of Mrs. Almayer's high-heeled sandals died away in the distance. The tranquilized master of the house was going to resume the conversation when, struck by an unexpected change in the expression of his guest's countenance, he turned his head and saw Nina standing in the doorway. After Mrs. Almayer's retreat from the field of battle, Nina, with a contemptuous exclamation, It's only a traitor, had lifted the conquered curtain, and now stood in full light, framed in the dark background on the passage, her lips slightly parted, her hair in disorder after the exertion. The angry gleam not yet faded out of her glorious and sparkling eyes. She took in at a glance the group of white-clad lancemen standing motionless in the shadow of the far-off end of the veranda and her gaze rested curiously on the chief of that imposing cortege he stood almost facing her a little on one side 
and struck by the beauty of the unexpected apparition, had bent low, elevating his joint hands above his head in a sign of respect accorded by Millais only to the great of this earth. The crude light of the lamp shone on the gold embroidery of his black silk jacket, broke in a thousand sparkling rays on the jeweled hilt of his crisp protruding from under the many folds of the red sarong gathered into a sash round his waist and played on the precious stones of the many rings on his dark fingers. He straightened himself up quickly after the low bow, putting his hand with a graceful ease on the hilt of his heavy short sword, ornamented with brilliantly dyed fringes of horsehair. Nina, hesitating on the threshold, saw an erect, lithe figure of medium height, with a breadth of shoulder suggesting a great power. Under the folds of a blue turban whose fringed ends hung gracefully over the left shoulder was a face full of determination and expressing a reckless good humor, not devoid, however, of some dignity. The squareness of lower jaw, the full red lips, the mobile nostrils, and the proud carriage of the head gave the impression of a being half savage, untamed, perhaps cruel, and corrected the liquid softness of the almost feminine eye the general characteristic of the race. Now, the first surprise over, Nina saw those eyes fixed upon her with such an uncontrolled expression of admiration and desire that she felt a hitherto unknown feeling of shyness mixed with alarm and some delight enter and penetrate her whole being. Confused by those unusual sensations, she stopped in the doorway and instinctively drew the lower part of the curtain across her face, leaving only half a round cheek, a stray tress, and one eye exposed, wherewith to contemplate the gorgeous and bold being so unlike in appearance to the rare specimens of traitors she had seen before on that same veranda. Dane Marula, dazzled by the unexpected vision, forgot the confused Almayer forgot his brig, his escort staring in open-mouthed admiration, the object of his visit, and all things else, in his overpowering desire to prolong the contemplation of so much loveliness met so suddenly in such an unlikely place, as he thought. "'It is my daughter,' said Almayer, in an embarrassed manner. "'It is of no consequence. White women have their customs, as you know, Tuan.' having traveled much, as you say. However, it is late. We will finish our talk tomorrow. Dane bent low, trying to convey in a last glance towards the girl the bold expression of his overwhelming admiration. The next minute, he was shaking Almayer's hand with grave courtesy, his face wearing a look of stolid unconcern as to any feminine presence. His men filed off, and he followed them quickly closely attended by a thick-set, savage-looking Sumatrice he had introduced before as the commander of his brig. Nina walked to the balustrade of the veranda and saw the sheen of moonlight on the steel spearheads and heard the rhythmic jingle of brass anklets as the men moved in single file towards the jetty. The boat shoved off after a while, looming large in the full light of the moon, a black shapeless mass in the slight haze hanging over the water. Nina fancied she could distinguish the graceful figure of the traitor standing erect in the stern sheets, but in a little while all the outlines got blurred, confused, and soon disappeared in the folds of white vapor shrouding the middle of the river. Almayer had approached his daughter and leaning with both arms over the rail was looking moodily down on the heap of rubbish and broken bottles at the foot of the veranda. "'What was all that noise just now?' he growled peevishly, without looking up. "'Confound you and your mother! What did she want? What did you come 
out for? She did not want to let me out, said Nina. She is angry. She says the man just gone is some Raja. I think she is right now. I believe all you women are crazy, snarled Elmayer. What's that to you, to her, to anybody? The man wants to collect trepang and birds' nests on the islands. He told me so, that Raja of yours. He will come tomorrow. I want you both to keep away from the house and let me attend to my business in peace. Dane Marula came the next day and had a long conversation with Almayer. This was the beginning of a close and friendly intercourse which, at first, was much remarked in Sambir till the population got used to the frequent sight of many fires burning in Almayer's Kampong, where Marula's men were warming themselves during the cold nights of the northeast monsoon, while their master had long conferences with the Tuan Puta, as they styled Almayer amongst themselves. Great was the curiosity in Sambir on the subject of the new trader. Had he seen the Sultan? What did the Sultan say? Had he given any presents? What would he sell? What would he buy? Those were the questions broached eagerly by the inhabitants of bamboo houses built over the river. Even in more substantial buildings, in Abdullah's house, and the residences of principal traders, Arab, Chinese, and Bujis, the excitement ran high and lasted many days. With inborn suspicion, they would not believe this simple account of himself the young trader was always ready to give yet it had all the appearance of truth he said he was a trader and sold rice he did not want to buy gutta perka or beeswax because he intended to employ his numerous crew in collecting trepang on the coral reefs outside the river and also in seeking for birds nests on the mainland those two articles he professed himself ready to buy if there were any to be obtained in that way. He said he was from Bali and a Brahmin, which last statement he made good by refusing all food during his often repeated visits to Lakamba's and Almayer's houses. To Lakamba he went generally at night and had long audiences. Babalachi, who was always a third party at those meetings of potentate and traitor, knew how to resist all attempts on the part of the curious to ascertain the subject of so many long talks. When questioned with languid courtesy by the grave Abdullah, he sought refuge in a vacant stare of his one eye in the affectation of extreme simplicity. I am only my master's slave, murmured Babalachi, in a hesitating manner. Then, as if making up his mind suddenly for a reckless confidence, he would inform Abdullah of some transaction of rice, repeating the words, A hundred big bags the sultan bought, a hundred tuan, and a voice of mysterious solemnity. Abdullah, firmly persuaded of the existence of some important dealings, received, however, the information with all the signs of respectful astonishment, and the two would separate, the Arab cursing inwardly the wily dog, while Bablachi went on his way, walking on the dusty path, his body swaying, his chin with its few gray hairs pushed forward, resembling an inquisitive goat bent on some unlawful expedition. Attentive eyes watched his movements. Jim Eng, descrying Babalachi far away, would shake off the stupor of an habitual opium smoker, and tottering on to the middle of the road, would await the approach of that important person, ready with hospitable invitation. But Babalachi's discretion was proof even against the combined assaults of a good fellowship and of strong gin, generously administered by the open-hearted Chinaman. Jim Eng, owning himself beaten, was left uninformed with the empty bottle 
and gazed sadly after the departing form of the statesman of Sambir, pursuing his devious and unsteady way, which, as usual, led to Almayer's compound. Ever since a reconciliation had been effected by Dane Marula between his white friend and the Raja, the one-eyed diplomatist had again become a frequent guest in the Dutchman's house. To Almayer's great disgust, he was to be seen there at all times, strolling about in an abstract kind of way on the veranda, skulking in the passages, or else popping round unexpected corners, always willing to engage Mrs. Almayer in confidential conversation. He was very shy of the master himself, as if suspicious that the pent-up feelings of the white man towards his person might find vent in a sudden kick. But the cooking shed was his favorite place, and he became an habitual guest there, squatting for hours amongst the busy women, with his chin resting on his knees, his lean arms clasped round his legs, and his one eye roving uneasily. The very picture of watchful ugliness, Almayer wanted more than once to complain to Lakamba of his Prime Minister's intrusion, but Dane dissuaded him. We cannot say a word here that he does not hear, growled Almayer. Then come and talk on board the brig, reported Dane with a quiet smile. It is good to let the man come here. Lakamba thinks he knows much. Perhaps the Sultan thinks I want to run away. Better let the one-eyed crocodile sun himself in your kampong, Tuan. And Almayer assented unwillingly, muttering vague threats of personal violence while he eyed malevolently the aged statesman sitting with quiet obstinacy by his domestic rice pot. 